Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. As always, I'm Billy. I got my man Dame here with me. How are we doing today, Dame? Hey, yeah, man, I'm doing good. I'm doing great. You know what I mean? We got some basketball coming on tonight, so I'm doing tomorrow. good. I'm excited. Oh, it's, oh, it's not, not tonight? Play tonight, yeah. Oh, Finals, I two. didn't even know that. Wow. They got two okay, days yeah. off, yeah. Uh, okay, that changes a lot of plans for me. Today. Right, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm still excited, bro. Can't wait for game two, you know what I mean? So, I'm feeling for sure. Good. Yeah, finals finally tipped off. Going to get the housekeeping out of the way, as always. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, go ahead and drop a five-star review for the podcast. This helps us out a ton, helps the channel out a ton. Y'all have been going crazy with the support on the TikTok and the, the Instagram page and the YouTube right. shorts. So we appreciate all the support there as always. We're getting these up daily, sometimes multiple uploads a day. So we appreciate all the support as always. Um, but yeah, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get right into it. Um, the NBA Finals finally tipped off uh, on Thursday night um, in Denver. And uh, I know we both had Denver in this in this game one. Haven't lost, mm-hmm. uh, haven't lost a game at home this entire postseason. Um, I don't know if we touched on it, but Miami actually hasn't lost a game one, and they've been yeah. on the road <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> every single <laughs> every single game one. So um, somebody's streak had to end, um, and it was Miami's that that came to an end here. Uh, Denver takes it one hundred four to ninety three. Um, lo- a lot of things to touch on for for both of these teams. Um, the biggest thing for me that I, I took away, at least from the heat side of things, um, I know we talked about this in our, our finals preview episode was we're going to need not just exceptional defense from Bam, but you're also going to have to have him step up on the offensive side of the ball uh, for them to have any type of chance to, to be competitive in this series, really. And this was a career high in field goal attempts for him, I believe, in any game. Um, definitely at least in his postseason career, but I'm pretty sure in any game in his career, um, 13 of 25 from the field. So um, not terrible efficiency, uh, but was hyper aggressive in this game, which is super aggressive. Yeah, it was definitely something that, you know, even despite the loss is something that Heat fans and, and Heat's coaching staff can see um, that they can continue to, to press him on moving forward, that he needs to keep that intensity up on the offensive side of the ball. Um because that was critical, critical for them to continue to, even as this game felt like it got out of hand for them in the second half there, um, you know, his continued aggression, um, his scoring output, the only Heat player over 20 points in this game, um, he kind of was, you know, put in like a boxing metaphor, he was that jab, right? He was just a consistent presence um, there for the Heat that kind of, you know, kept them in the game. And um, they found something a little bit later, shots finally started to fall for them. Uh, but it was a little bit too late at that point in time. But but he kept them close with, with his scoring there. So I think that's a uh, that's something good good to see out of Bam. Um, something they can look to potentially continue to utilize in Game Two and moving forward in this series. But um, what did you think about him? And, and really, also, what did you think about Jimmy? Who, to me, I think as aggressive as Bam was, Jimmy, I think, had one of his least aggressive uh, outings of this postseason. Only finished with thirteen points. Only took fourteen shots. Um, and it wasn't for lack of opportunities. You know, there, there wasn't, you know, a ton of heavy coverage on him, not a ton of, you know, traps or double teams. The options were there, um, but it just seemed like he was as aggressive looking to score as he's been in some of his prior games. So the thing about Bim is I think you could look at it from two ways. You could definitely look at it from a, a perspective of, well, you know, it's a great sign that he's being aggressive, that he's looking for a shot, you know, scoring pretty well. Then you can also look at it from another way as like, we got this aggressive Bam and we shot horrible from three and we lost. So it's like, did we waste a game where Bam could possibly have his best offensive game of the entire series, the way Bam is inconsistent offensively. So mm-hmm. you can look at it from both ways. I mean, obviously it's a, it's a good sign just that he's being aggressive. Um, Cause then you could say, well, at least he, he might carry this over into the next game. So as far as Jimmy, I don't know. It's a little weird. I mean, when you really, really think about it, when is the last time you've really seen like a, Jimmy Butler, like, I'm going to take over this game type of performance from him. Like, I mean, he, I, he had a couple good games in the first couple, first two against Boston. But mm-hmm. other than that, it seemed like he's kind of been coasting a little bit. Like, he's been not as aggressive. 
hasn't been really looking for his shot. He's been very, very passive. There's a lot of times where he drives to the basket, and I can see him kick out and on opportunities where I think that he could have rolls up and try to get a shot off for himself. Yeah. So um, that's just puzzling to see. Um, I don't really know what's the reasoning for this. Like, I've, I've seen some speculation that oh, his ankle might be bothering him, but it's like he had 35 points in the game one of Boston. That was way after the ankle injury. Like, yeah. I don't – I, I don't think the ankle injury is a problem. I just think he's just being too passive. There's times where it seems like he's trying to get his guys going. He's trying to get shots for Caleb Martin, trying to get shots for uh for Max Struess. But there's just times where I feel like Jimmy just needs to take over the game, be aggressive, and score. Like, I just feel like he's playing a little bit too passive right now. And like I said, having Bam be this aggressive, having Bam shoot this many shots and and shoot this well, and then you kind of have, I'm not going to say a complete no show, but you don't have a a, a normal Jimmy Butler game. It it kind of feels like a waste, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. that, that was just interesting to see. And, I mean, you guys wasted this game. The Nuggets shot 29% from three. It's like they didn't shoot too great. You know what yeah. I mean? I know you guys didn't shoot good as well, good either, but I just feel like this game could be looked at as, as a waste, basically. Yeah, there's it, interesting things to take away from both sides. Um, you know, even just like we both said, kind of the eye test of Jimmy not being as aggressive. Um, when pulled some of the stats from this entire postseason run for him, he's averaging over 17 drives per game um, throughout all of the, the previous three series um, and over uh, 11 and a half, 12 points per uh, points off of those drives. Um, throughout the, the first two playoff series. And then game one, he only drove the ball eight times and had two points off of those drives. So significant drop-off, not in even just the scoring output, but just the aggression to get downhill, to get into the paint. Um, so, you know, the stats back up the eye test there. Um, he only scored two points on eight, you know, <clears throat> pick and roll handler possessions, um, three points on eight dribble pull-ups. Um, so he it just – all in all, a, a lack of aggression scoring output for Jimmy. Um, the, the role players that had been playing so well, I think, you know, to your point, Jimmy has this huge explosion in the first round against Milwaukee. But the last two series against New York and Boston, his play has almost went regress may be too harsh, but he was playing like otherworldly, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like he's still obviously playing at an elite level, but the role players play, I think, has stepped up even higher. And the combination of that has really continued to propel this heat team. All of that cooled off. It felt like in game one. I mean, Max yeah. Struz, Max Struz didn't score in this game. 0 for 10 mm-hmm. from the field, 0 for 9 from three. Caleb Martin, your <laughs> Eastern Conference Finals MVP, one for seven from the field. Three. Points. Not making me look too good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, hey, it's a different different series. Different series. It is. It's a completely different series. But um, no, nah, I, I I fully agree with what you're saying. It's just, yeah, it's tough. I don't I don't know why he's just being so passive. I don't get it. And it seemed like he started the game off. If if I'm not mistaken, he started the game off scoring. I think three buckets, something like that. Like mm-hmm. he he looked like he was made an effort to look for a shot at least in the beginning of the game, and then just after that, I just he just stopped shooting. I don't know. Like I don't know what it is, honestly. Yeah, it, it, like, to look at the game from start to finish, right, like you said, Jimmy came out aggressive. Um, the, the theme of the first quarter for me is Miami is a team that for years has been this way, but especially, again, on this playoff run, they are so versatile on the defensive side of the ball. If they're going, man, heavy, heavy into switching any type of screen action, and the Nuggets obviously understanding this said, well, look, we're a bigger team than you are by a wide margin, All right? Mm-hmm. Like Bam is undersized for a center realistically. So we're bigger than you. If you're going to switch these ball screens, we're going to take advantage of that. And immediately, you know, Jamal Murray's bringing the ball up the court. They've got Struess on him. They've got Gabe Vincent on him. And here comes Aaron Gordon and set him a screen. One of them switches on to Aaron Gordon. They give the ball to AG and he's driving at them every single time. Attacking closeouts. He had double digit points, I think, in the first quarter, right? Yeah, um, like 12. Right. They had no answer for um for Aaron Gordon there in the first quarter, which forced the heat into their zone, which as we touched on already, Jokic had done a great job in the regular season of attacking the zone. The Nuggets were the mm-hmm. best team against the zone in the regular season. Obviously, this heat zone has been on another level um that we've seen in this postseason, but 
They've never played an offense this postseason that's operating on this high of a level as Denver. Um, mm-hmm. In the first half, Jokic tore that thing apart. <laughs> Double-digit assists in the first half. Um, some of the passes he was making, it just it looks like he's seeing the game two, three passes ahead. Um, you know, slick feeds on, on backdoor cuts, hitting everybody where they where they need to be in, in order to score, um, getting everybody involved. Um, so like I said, going into halftime with, with double digit assists for Jokic, um, I think he had the the most assists for any player in their first finals game ever. Um, yeah. Regardless of position, he's doing it as a center. So um, just another unbelievable stat line from the guy who's playing like and is right now the best player in the world. Um, in the second half, I will say, I think the heat went back to the zone and it looked a little bit better. They had a couple of runs there in the third quarter and then to start the fourth quarter, I think they had an 11 0 or an 11 0 run, which cut it to 10 or nine points, got it to single digits a few times there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think what it was able to do was disrupt is the best word I could use the, the two man game between. Um, Jamal Murray and Jokic, they play so well off of the off of each other, doing dribble handoffs, Jokic coming and playing as a screener. Um, the zone made that a little bit more murky, made it muddy, wasn't as clean. Um, right. But again, being the best player in the world right now, it got to that point. Like I said, they closed it to single digits. Jokic got the ball on the block. He scored six straight points for them. Hey. Exactly. And calm the Nuggets back down, got it back to a comfortable spot, um, and they were able to finish the game out. So um, on the on the Denver side of things, that I think is what has impressed me about Jokic so much this entire postseason. I know I've talked about it so many times. I feel like I can't say it enough. The amount of different ways that he is able to beat you, whether that's being the, the quarterback of the offense mm-hmm. or when it's needed of him, to just command the ball and get timely buckets is he, he, he's always making the right play. It feels like he's never making a rush decision. It feels like he's never making an incorrect decision. Um, finishing this game with a 27 point triple double, 14 assists. And again, insane efficiency, eight for 12 from the field, um, 10 for 12 from the free throw line. So um, going to be interested to see what Miami looks to do moving forward. Um, like I said, I think the zone looked a lot a lot better there in the second half. Um, and, and obviously the shot started to fall for them there in the second quarter. So if those guys can get hot, you know, maybe it gets an interesting, a little bit more interesting in game two. Uh, but for most of this game, Denver was was really comfortable. Um, Miami had a really hard time stopping all of the different motion that they're able to throw out on the offensive side of the ball. Had a hard time dealing with the size that they present, um, which is all things I know that we, we talked about in the preview. and. It, right. At the end of the day, right, like it's going to be a tough task to beat this team that's this talented, that's healthy when you're already undermanned, right? You're, you're down with injuries mm-hmm. um, and, and that you're, you're going up against the best offense in the league with one of the most skilled players that we've ever seen. Like yeah. it's going to be very <laughs> difficult. So like we already said that he have their work cut out for them. So I'm interested to see – how Spo responds in game two, how the, the Heat team responds in game two, but um, they're going to have to – their best bet, I think, is really just continue to just grind it out, work on the defensive end. You're never going to stop them, but disrupt, I think, is really the right word. Like, you have to make them a little uncomfortable because they look far too comfortable in game one. And I don't even know how you get, get to that point because, like, we you talked about with Jokic, it's like this guy is able to dominate the game without – scoring the basketball without shooting the basketball he is controlling the entire offense without even looking for a shot I don't think he scored a point in the first quarter until like the last like couple seconds he got like a steal and like a little layup so he and he was dominating the game offensively like it is insane to see like the only people I've ever seen in my lifetime that can dominate the game in so many different ways as far as getting your teammates involved and then also knowing when that time is for me all right this is my time I'm going to score now is Jokic and LeBron. Those are the only people that I've seen in my life that can do it so easily and know exa- and know exactly when to turn that switch on. Cause like we talked about Jokic dominating with his passing in the first in the first, I think, 
through like three quarters basically. He was he was scoring here and there because of Jokic, you know what I mean? But I think he had 12 points in that fourth quarter when it was time to close the game out. Like, all right, it is my time. Give me the ball. And then he, I think you said he scored like six straight points and it right. was like 12 points in the fourth quarter. Ended with, I think, almost a 30-point triple-double. So Jokic, his ability to dominate the game and know when to turn that switch on is just – he he said he's one of the like all time great offensive players ever. Like, and I don't that's not even debatable at this point. So, um, yeah, it's crazy. And it goes into the fact that um the Nuggets are just so hard to beat because they can beat you in so many different ways. It's like I talked about before, they shot 29% from the three. Their threes aren't falling. So, like well, again, with Miami, if this was Boston, their threes aren't falling, they're just gonna lose. Like, that's the only way they really can beat you. Mm-hmm. With the Nuggets. They can go inside. They have players who can create shots in the mid range. It's like they play good defense. They can get out in transition. They can beat you in so many different ways. And then on top of that, so it's like their offense stalls out. All right, Jamal Murray can create his own shot. He's looking like one of the best scorers in the league, basically. And if that fails, it's like, all right, let's just give the ball to the best player on the planet. Right. Just have him go to work. So it's like the Nuggets just look like an unstoppable team just because you slow one thing down, they come at you with another thing. You slow one thing down, they come at you with another thing. It's like, it, it's so hard to beat this team. They're so balanced. The roster is so well, so greatly put together. It, it's tough, man. It's really tough. Like I said, I'm interested to see what Spo does, but honestly, I'm not even going to fault him if they have no answer. Because right now, it's what, what can you really do to slow down this Denver team? Like, honestly, like your best bet might be to just let Jokic score 50. Because when he gets his teammates involved, I feel like that's I feel like that's when they're most dangerous when he's getting their teammate with him getting his teammates involved and is being a pass first player, you might just have to go one on one, let Jokic drop fifty and just hope that the other players just don't get it going. Yeah. When at when the whole team is getting it going, that's when like the avalanche starts, right? They feel like an unbeatable machine. Um, right. it's funny you say that about, you know, do you don't know what Spoke can do, what adjustment he can make that's gonna save them. Um, I think he said it was either before or after game one, uh, he was in a, a press conference and he said, scheme isn't going to win us this, this series. Like scheme is not going to save us. Mm. Like there are going to have to be, to your point, individual performances on this heat team. Um, that is the difference maker here because X's and O's are only going to do so much and right. playing like we've said, a team that's operating at this level, players who are operating at this level, scheme can only take you so far. At the end of the day, people have to step up and make plays. And if that's yeah. to your point, bam, we're going to put you on that island. It's Nobody's helping. We're not coming for help. That's tough because you right. he can't guard him one-on-one. He's going to get in foul trouble. And it's not even no disrespect to bam. No one can guard this guy one-on-one. Right. We just saw he did Anthony Davis. It's like it's no disrespect to Bam. This guy is just that good. Yeah. So we've said it plenty of times. Like Spoh's got his work cut out. We've said it, I think about every coach that has coached right. against the Nuggets <laughs> in this playoffs. They have got their work cut out for them. Yeah. Hundred um, percent. I know we've said it. I know everybody has said it this postseason. Like Spo, this year when he's able to have gotten out of this heat team, I think is really cleared himself as far and away the best coach in the league. So look, Mm -hmm. if anybody is going to be equipped to, to make it difficult, at least it's going to be him. Um, So I said, I'm interested to see what they come out with in game two. Um, I definitely think we'll we'll see some different looks on the defensive end. I think they'll mix in some more of their, their two, two, one zone action. Um, And uh, yeah, I, I, if they can get their shooters to respond, and I know Hero was out warming up in, in game one. I heard rumors that he may be coming back for potentially game three at home in Miami. Um, mm. You know, that's, again, another another person who can space the floor, can stretch the floor, but additionally someone who can create their own shot, which um, the Heat can never go wrong with adding more people like that who can, um, you know, kind of – release some ball pressure off of, you know, Jimmy and Gabe and have an additional person there to, right. to be able to handle the ball and, and create for themselves. So um, series is, is far from over, but, you know, if, if game one is any indication, this, this Nuggets team, like we both said, is just 
They're the best team in basketball right now. Too good, man. This um, team is just too good, bro. <laughs> It's honestly, I texted you, it's disgusting to watch how much better they are <laughs> than everyone. You know what's kind of funny, too? This whole year, everyone was talking about how, oh, it's so much parody in the league. It's like anyone can come out of the West, anyone can come out of the East. Like, there's so much parody. When you really Us think about included, it, yeah. I know, yeah. Come, I, I said the same exact thing. I said, look, bro, when we were, when the Lakers were fighting to make the play, I said, I, I'm fine with playing Denver. Looking back, We'd have lost in the first round and got <laughs> bounced up out of there. But, bro, it's funny how everyone was saying, like, us included, so much parody in the league. When you really look at it, it really kind of wasn't throughout the whole – like, throughout the whole season. Denver's been the one seed the whole season. Just yeah. the fact that no one really respected them, and myself included. They wiped through everybody in the regular season, got to the playoffs, wiped through everybody in the playoffs, and if they handled the heat how they look, how they look like they're going to, it's like – in reality, was there really parity in the West the whole time, or was it just nobody was really respecting the one seed that's been the one seed the entire season? I still feel like there was, right? Like, you know, the, the Grizzlies get taken out early. Um, Kings Warriors was such a great series. Like, there was everything else outside of Denver was competitive, and the East has been – obviously, you got the eight seed. <laughs> the East out. is crazy, yeah. The East uh, is crazy. So there still was a ton of parity, but to your point, right, this Denver team – um, flew under the radar, I think. Well, still, to national media, I feel like, are flying under the radar in terms of how dominant they are. Mm-hmm. Um, and should have been a clear, you know, favorite to come out of the West. Um, obviously, I think the KD trade and him going to the Suns definitely changed a lot of opinions there. And people, again, were just banking on talent in that situation. Um, I know that we were both skeptical of that from the get-go, but look, like you said, they've been the one seed for pretty much the entirety of the season, and they are playing like the one seed out west. They're playing like the best team in basketball and um, trending like they are going to be able to bring the first championship to Denver if they can can keep how they played up in game one up for the ne- next few games. So um before we move off of this i do need to give a shout out to haywood highsmith boy was hooping he's been hooping bro he's that's another one of those draft undrafted guys that just seem like they come out of nowhere and they they, 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 they he subs them right into the game instant impact like he's been playing very very well mm-hmm. two steals had a block um i think he I think both <laughs> of those steals were like Rips around half court that he was able to score off of immediately. Finished with 18 points, 7 to 10 from the field. Um, he's probably going to get a lot of minutes here in game two. Maybe he has the the, the Caleb Martin impact from, never from know. last year. He's, like we said, it's always like one or two of these role players that steps up with Jimmy and Bam that kind of creates, like, I don't even want to say a three-headed monster. But you then have like <laughs> three consistent right. players. Um along with just everybody else trying to play their role as best they can. So, um, yeah, cr- cr- props to him. Kudos to him. He, he had a great game. Um, and, and down the stretch had some big shots, which, again, just kept it, it relatively close. I don't think it was ever, you know, really got to an uncomfortable point for Denver. But, um, you know, he played really well. Um, <laughs> I saw people saying that uh, they, they need to give uh, Udonis some run. <laughs> see, see if he can stop Jokic. What if he go? What if he, what if he checked the UD? And he was just clamping Jokic. Like, and you know that that old school, he just crafty, bro. You know what I mean? Yeah. He'll get to the spot quicker. <laughs> nah, UD would get his – he would get oh. destroyed if he tried to guard Jokic. That wouldn't even be fair, bro. That'd be a crime. Yeah, bro, he is 42. Bro, UD don't even – he don't even got shorts under them warm-ups, bro. He just – he just pull up in the warm-ups. <laughs> he's just there, bro. He know he's not playing, and he shouldn't play. But he's there. He's a coach on the sideline, bro. Yeah. That Look, is funny. whatever happens in this series, I don't care. It's a if we get to Game Four and the Nuggets are up three zero and they're blowing the Heat out. Mm-hmm. Donis Haslam better be on the court. Oh yeah, in the last awesome. game. I don't For care sure. if it's the Heat going out or if the Heat are winning the series. Like Udonis Haslam needs to check in. He needs to get a current call, especially at least in one of the games in Miami. Like, mm-hmm. let that man get, like, one more standing ovation for all that he's done for the city. Um, you know, that jersey is going to be in the Raptors – or in the in the rafters. 
Um, they should be. Very they soon. Be. They need to retire it next year. Just get it over with because it's well deserved from him. One hundred percent. Yo, quick, quick question before we move on. Because I was, I was listening to people talk about you know the Denver altitude and things like that. You went to the Denver game. Was it? It's like, do you notice that, or is that, like, to what, me, what I didn't notice any difference. I saw, and I was expecting to, right? Like I grew up with mm. asthma. I'm expecting to be. Like, I'm gonna step off the plane and be, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Like, um, and and I, you know, I heard people talking about it wasn't even about doing anything athletic or running around. Um, just, you know, NBA commentators will say, you get into the hotel room and you notice the air is different, right? They had the oxygen things on on Chuck and, uh, and what's the name? That was I don't doing, know what that was broadcast. about. Look, <laughs> I was in the city for four days, uh, out and about, downtown, hanging out, went, went to the arena, all that. I didn't notice any difference in the air at all. Um, mm. Now, again, granted, I'm not playing 30 plus, 40 plus minutes in, a, in an NBA game. So maybe right. if I was, you know, you get your lungs working a little bit, that air feels a little bit more thin. Um, so I don't know. I can't speak to it from a player's perspective, but at least from a, a fan, someone that was, you know, in the arena or just in the city, I didn't really notice that much of a difference. I feel like it's, it's getting blown out of proportion. But, hey, you know, I, I can't speak <clears throat> for everybody, and I definitely can't speak for any of the players. So – um, yeah, I, I, we, I know it definitely makes a difference because we see it even in the NFL, right? People go play in Denver and it's right. They got the oxygen mask on the, the sideline. And them linemen come off the field and they look like they are gassed. So I, I, I can imagine it definitely makes an impact when you're actually being athletic. But man, Grant Hill and them <laughs> on the court <laughs> getting ready to commentate with the oxygen mask, <laughs> I feel like that's just for show. That that's what made me want to ask because I was like I I I agree with the players or I believe the players when they said it affects him playing obviously like I agree with that part but I wanted to know about the fans perspective like is it really like you walk in there and like you can't breathe because the way they made it seem was like there's no oxygen in the whole state of Colorado so <laughs> I wanted to ask you because I know you went to the Nuggets game and I don't, I never got a chance to ask you that so that's interesting though yeah yeah I I think they're they're doing too much it's it's for clicks it's for views. <laughs> Um, but yeah, moving on to some of the news that we've had around the league. Um, I think the biggest one, and honestly surprised me, probably surprised a lot of people. Detroit, a lot of people thought that this job was pretty much a shoe in for Kevin Ollie, you know, had been with UConn for a while, um, and, and had worked with, with overtime elite this past <clears throat> year, I believe. So that seemed like almost a seamless fit, right, was coaching so many of the young guys there in overtime elite, get with the young roster in Denver, get them to develop. It made sense, right? But Detroit went out and got Monty Williams and made him, I believe, right, the highest paid coach in the NBA right now by, I think, over $2 million, right? I think, yeah, Popovich is making $11.5 million a year. Uh, Monty Williams is making over $13 million a year. He just signed a six-year, $78.5 million contract that can go up to eight years, over $100 million with incentives. I didn't even know you could put incentives in a coaching contract. He got some – it's a player contract. <laughs> That's what I was about to on. say. Incentives? I didn't know that was a thing. Like, what did the incentives win a championship? Like, I, look, I don't know. I haven't. I don't think the when you know, coach of the year have come out yet. Um, but look, eight years, a hundred m's. Man, get your bag, bro, because they I did you wrong. Him, Monty. In Phoenix. Um, I respect it, Monty. I really do. And I think that is look. They are what we just saw with the turnaround that he was able to do in Phoenix, right? That whole narrative, I know we talked about it, right? Devin Booker was an empty stats guy until Monty got there, changed the culture, propelled him into this new level of stardom, right? Um, we both think was a bad fire, right? Mm -hmm. Scapegoated. It's a two-time coach of the year. Like, still can't believe that. But um, one man's trash is another man's treasure. And Detroit went out and they got their guy. They are... That is a great spot for him with all the young talent they have with Cade Cunningham and, and Jay Nivey and Jalen Duran. 
Um, they got the fifth overall pick this year. People are projecting that that could be a guy like Cam Whitmore who could come in and fit really well with them, potentially one of the Thompson twins. Um, they have options there, the, you know, just continue to build that young culture. And they still have pieces that are tradable, right? Like they have um, Bogdanovich, who, mm-hmm. again, I didn't even think he would make it the full year in Detroit, um, but he'll get moved to a contender. I'm almost certain of it this year. That right. could bring in some more young talent, right? And get draft capital, whatever the case may be. Um, and, and potentially, right. And they have Wiseman now too. So mm-hmm. like, you just have a lot of young talent that he can mold and develop. And we know that he's good at it, right? We just saw him turn a franchise around very quickly. Um, And so Detroit is in a a really good spot. And I think that this will only continue to fuel whatever little beef it is that Cade and Jalen Green have (laughs) going on. It's because the Rockets went out, they got Ime. Detroit went out, they got Monty. So both of them look like they got their foundation set with a, a great exactly. coach. Mm-hmm. Um, so excited to see what how you know that Detroit Houston. I don't know if it's necessarily a rivalry between. It's not even teams. a rivalry. Jalen Jalen Green is the real one that's trying to make it a rivalry, bro. He's the one that's like that's giving all the takes. Like I should have went number one. I'm gonna go at Cade in the summer league. Like Jalen Green is the one that's trying to make it a rivalry. I'm here for it though. I'm always, here, I'm always here for it. But, yeah, I do agree. I like how they both have someone that brings stability, that you know are, are great coaches, you know what I mean, that can develop young players, that can turn franchises around, that can set the culture. So I think it's obviously a great hire for both. I'm glad that these young guys uh, have their guys, basically, these young these young rising stars. So it is great for them, great for the organizations, great for those young players. Yeah, so um... – he took over the Suns in 2018. The Suns were a 19-win team. And we saw what he was able to do with that franchise in just like two years. Had mm. them at number one seed in the West, had them winning over 60 games in a season. He's taken over a Detroit team that was a 17-win team. He's going to look to replicate that success and take it further than he was able to in Phoenix. So. He's got the core to do it. I, I'm I'm really excited to watch Detroit this year. I'm hopeful that Kay can come back healthy and, and pick up where mm-hmm. he left off. Because even before he got hurt this year, he was starting the season off hot. Um, so really excited for that. Another coach and hire, um, your old old team's coach Frank Vogel. Frank e. of, all right, speaking of Monty Williams, he goes and replaces Monty in Phoenix, um, and he's taking over the job for. A fraction of what <laughs> what Monty got paid. He did not get the same bag. He didn't um, deserve it. <laughs> he did not uh, deserve it. So he got a five year, thirty one million dollar deal um, to become the new head coach of the Phoenix Suns. So Matt Ishbia makes his move, gets rid of Monty, and he brings in what he believes is his guy and Frank Vogel um, to to lead up KD and D Book and, and the Phoenix Suns. So as a as a Lakers fan, this man brought a championship to your to your franchise. So what he do you did. think about Frank Vogel? What do you think about um, the fit there with him in Phoenix? I mean, I don't think he's a bad coach at all. I mean, like you said, he had to be – he brought a, he helped us win a championship with the Lakers. So I just think it's funny that going from Monty to Frank Vogel, it's like, okay, I get – like, I don't, I don't get the obsession with wanting to bring in your guy. If you're the guy that's already there is great at his job, it's like, you don't just go into a company and just fire everybody, even if they're good at their job, just because you want to bring in your guys. I don't think that's how it should work. So, I mean, like I say, he's not. I don't think he's a bad coach. I just think going from Monty Williams to Frank Vogel, it's a little bit of a downgrade. But, I mean, in my opinion, I really feel like it's just up to the roster around them, being able to build a solid roster. Because, like we said, they have no depth. They're going to have to trade one of their pieces, whether it be DeAndre Ayton. They're going to have to trade someone in order to fill out this roster because – I like we've seen, no matter who the coach is, Devin Booker and KD and a bunch of whoever is not going to get it done. It's not going to make it far, especially with teams like Denver in the West, these other good teams, up and coming mm-hmm. teams in the West. So, it's from in my opinion, I feel like it. I need to see what the rest of the roster looks like before I make my my prediction of how the Suns will do this season. Yeah, I think he's not going to be a bad hire, right? With the talent that the team has. 
and with his mm-hmm. track record as a, a coach in the NBA, even going back to you know his time with with Indiana and the Pacers, it's not going to be a bad hire, right? I, obviously, right, as a championship winning coach that can never be taken away from him. Mm-hmm. Um, it still all just feels bad how the situation played out with exactly. the organization and Monty. Um, so I, it's going to be tough shoes to fill despite, you know, there are disappointing exits to the playoffs these past two years, because at the end of the day, like we said, Monty took this team back to a place of relevance when they were the laughing stock of the NBA for a very long time. So like I said, I, there's a lot of work to still be done with that roster. So um not going to be too critical of Frank Vogel. I'll need to, to see what the, the, uh, what they're able to do from a team construction perspective, because again, that was both of our biggest gripes with exactly. what happened to them in this postseason. I don't think it mattered coaching wise. Could have had have Jackson. Depth. Yeah, I was going right. to lose regardless. Could have had John Wooden. It would not have right. mattered. <laughs> it would not have mattered. It's crazy to think about Kevin Durant. Four, like this is like his fourth coach in like four years. Like the yeah. post Golden State era is like, it's been it's been kind of rough. Like it's what just not even I'm not even just talking about like legacy and all that. So I'm just stability wise, it's been kind of rough. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because so, he went to to Brooklyn. They had uh, they had Kenny Atkinson when he got there, right? Um, and then he got rid of him for, sure. for Steve Nash. Then Steve Nash. Then Jacques Vaughn. Then Monty. Then now Frank Vogel. Yeah. Well, no, they had um. Did they have somebody before Jacques Vaughn? Am I tripping? I thought it was just straight to Jacques Vaughn. Uh, I don't remember. I don't remember anybody because my because Steve Nash got fired like weeks yeah. like a, what a week into the season or something like that. Oh, okay, yeah, it was Steve Nash and the Jock Vaughn. Um, yeah, no, yeah, no. I think when he got there, yeah, it was Kenny Atkinson, and then Jock Vaughn was the interim, and then they brought in Steve Nash and then fired Steve Nash for Jock Vaughn. Um, so yeah, a lot of a lot of turnover there, and then he got to Phoenix, like you said, Monty, and now he's going to be on Frank Vogel. So that's Technically, five coaches, same coach twice, but um, you know, with Jacques Vaughn mm. being the interim before Steve, so yeah, um, man, not a lot of stability there from a, a coaching perspective. If you do care about the legacy aspect, people are continuing the the conversations are going to come up every off season that he doesn't win a ring that he didn't get it done before Steph, you haven't gotten it done after Steph. I don't get too much into that because <laughs> when I look at it, he was the best player on, on that team. <laughs> he definitely uh, was. I'm not going to lie. So, look, I think legacy conversations get overblown anyways, but they, they it's ain't a, wrong. It's, They're not wrong. It's just, it's just a tough post-Warriors life. That's just what it's been. It's been a it's been a rough post-Warriors life. So, yeah. Gotta feel bad. I, I, would, I mean, honestly – a lot, some of the stuff he really does to himself, as far as like trying to put these team together, is like he's a terrible GM. I'll just say that right now. He's not. He's not the GM. He's not the GM. LeBron, even LeBron sometimes is a horrible GM. Trevor Westbrook was man. You should, that was, maybe just maybe we should leave it up to the actual GM. <laughs> we we should we should probably let them do their jobs, but um yeah. So some of it is it, done to himself, but I just want to see. I would love to see. I love watching Kevin Durant play, so I I do want to see him in a stable place. With a set roster, not a thrown together roster, not a super team with no depth. And I really want to see how it like how it would play out. Like if he stayed in Brooklyn, I know they had their problems but when it was Kyrie, KD, and a bunch of great role players around them, solid role role players. I would have wanted to see how they were gonna stack up in the East, especially right. the East that just had an eighth seed go to the finals. You don't know what could happen, bro. You could have been in the finals right now. I'm just throwing that out there. You never they know. They were what looking happen. like the best team in the East for a large portion of the past year. Yeah, and that's why that the you, Kyrie trade request was such a bombshell. It was like, bro, y'all are playing, playing phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> you're playing great right now. And now you want to trade that I don't know. It's it just it didn't make sense. I would have loved to seen seen him, especially now that we see their Boston's flaws. We see Milwaukee have their problems. Like you just seen Philadelphia have their struggles. You don't know what could happen. You guys could be playing in the finals right now. You never know. So this is kind of kind of sad know. to see. Yeah. Speaking of Trade requests and Philly and Boston, right? Getting into some of the rumors that's been dropping around the league. 
First of all, Payne Pritchard has requested a trade. I, I didn't know. I didn't know some of these guys could do that. Hey man, I don't know. If you're not happy with the situation, take Thomas Bryant. He wanted yeah. out of the Lakers. He wanted more minutes. And hey, look, it worked out for him. He's about to win a ring. <laughs> he is about to win a ring. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is like a few times that these rumors have come out about Payne Pritchard that he is not happy with his role in Boston, which look at the end of the day, from a competitive standpoint, I I empathize with, right? Like if you want to be on the court, he doesn't get mm-hmm. play. Um, I don't know what team or is gonna if he has like a huge trade market out there for him, but I think um, he's a solid player though. I don't think yeah, he's a bad player. He can definitely score the ball. Yeah, he brings like a little spark. Else. He brings like a little spark off the bench. There was some times, not nece- not really this postseason, but I remember last postseason. Postseason, there was a lot of times where he came off the bench and provided some scoring for them. So he definitely could give you like a little spark off the bench at times. Yeah. So. According to the Athletic, it says he has made it clear he hopes to be traded this offseason. So he putting his foot down. My fault, big bro. <laughs> you got it, you got it bro. <laughs> uh, additionally, um, ESPN is reporting that the Knicks are closely monitoring the situation in Philly with Joel Embiid and are just keeping a close eye on if he has any – any want to potentially get get out of Philly force his way out. Um, and apparently the Knicks are a team to look out for to uh to try to make a run um, if that occurs. So that's actually when you really think about it though, Joel Embiid paired with Jalen Brunson. Mm-hmm. That's not bad though. I need to see who they obviously Julius Randle will be gone, but like I need to see who they would give up, but that potentially is not bad. Hey, I'm not opposed to that. Look, I know we already talked about it with Nick Nurse. If he went to New York, oh, my gosh, he's playing 48 minutes a night. <laughs> Get back. His knees, <laughs> my knee is hurting just thinking about it. Like... <laughs> nah, that'd be crazy. Um, no. I mean, but... But forcing your way out of Philly for what? You're the You're one of the problems in Philly. It's like, what are you forcing your way out of Philly for? Like, now because you don't got no scapegoat, you might be forcing your way out of Philly. I'm not hearing that, bro. Play better in the postseason. Up your game in the postseason. Stop being a lesser version of yourself in the postseason. Until, you, like, I, well, hi, what did, you guys say? I was going to say, did you see the reporters pressing Nick Nurse about James Harden? Yeah. <laughs> bro, it was like, it was like, them Philly reporters way different than in Toronto. <laughs> 100%. They asked him. Man, so what do, you, what do you think about James Harden? Like, do you want him back? He's like, you know, he's trying to give the diplomatic answer, you know. Mm-hmm. We, James Harden's a great player. A reporter cut him off. You didn't answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, right. yeah, he, uh, look, I don't know what he want out for. Like you said, he he's a big part of the reason for a lot of the past couple of years that Philly has hit this wall in the second round that they have. So, mm-hmm. at this point, you got to see the process through, bro. Like, you're part you of got, the process. You bro. gotta bring them something. You're the face make, of the make process. a final. <laughs> That's all you got. Make an Eastern. You didn't even make an Eastern Conference Finals. Forget the finals at this point. You didn't even go to the Eastern Conference Finals. You can't like. I, and I know this is like he hasn't done it yet. So I'm not like trying to hate on Joel. Like, he hasn't done it. But like mm-hmm. you can't force your way out of a place that you're the problem in. Like I feel like forcing your way out is like I don't like how the organizations run. Like, I'm giving my all, and I'm not getting nothing back. Like, Dane forcing his way out is, like, completely different than Joel and B. Like, you're part of the problem, bro. <laughs> you're right. Uh, going to some of the Lakers around – or some of the rumors around the Lakers. There we go. Um, first one here, the Athletic is reporting that the Lakers are more interested in moving D'Angelo Russell than retaining him and may look to do a signing trade this offseason with one of the big targets being Fred Van Vliet. How would you feel about a sign and trade sending D Lo to Toronto to Toronto and bringing in the light skinned Fred Van Vliet? I'm not mad at it. I think it'd be I think it'd be a nice little fit. I think he'll fit well with LeBron and Anthony Davis. He's he's a great shooter. I feel like, yeah, I feel like it, it'd be a good fit. I'm not mad at it. I just think D Lo, his postseason struggles, I don't know if I we can't bring him back. I just feel like we can't bring him back. Well, he's too much of a liability in the postseason. We seen Fred Van Vliet contribute. The postseason runs, we see him contribute to good teams. 
he, like I said, he fits well with us. I, I wouldn't be mad at it. <laughs> Somebody photoshopped him, uh, or as it might not have been a photoshop, he was taking a taking a jumper in Denver's arena. <laughs> it was like report D Logan shops up, shots up after game one of the NBA finals. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, that means it's too funny, bro. <laughs> it's it's just bad because he done it. He did it after every bad game he had and kept having bad games. That shot still wasn't falling, bro. At that point, pack it up, bro. Get out of the gym. It's did, not. It's not for you, bro. Did you see the RDC skit about the Lakers getting swept? I didn't see. I didn't see it yet. I told him I, I didn't see it yet. <laughs> At the end of it, uh, LeBron is going crazy in the locker room, and D'Lo walks in, and it was actually it's like after Game Four. He was like, "Who? I just shot a hundred shots, and I was making a lot of them. I don't know why they weren't falling in the game." And LeBron like runs at him. Oh man! So, oh man! I gotta watch that. Yeah, no, that's, but... bro, hilarious. They're hilarious. Um, <clears throat> another Lakers rumor. Um, Athletic is also reporting that Rui is priority one B, and that their top priority this offseason is Austin Reeves. AR fifteen, baby. Listen. We're bringing both of those guys back. Nobody is taking them from us, bro. We're not getting poached by the Spurs. I'm not hearing that, bro. Get out of here. Y'all got Wimby. Y'all straight. Build around him. Y'all not taking our players, bro. Uh, I said, listen, the priority needs to be bring back Austin Reeves, bring back Rui Hachimura, and then we go from there. Mm-hmm. That's, listen, that's the priority right now. I think that's a good so, game plan. Because I, 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 st- I still feel like, bro, if we have a season – where we don't start so far behind that we got to start playing playoff basketball at the All-Star break. We have an opportunity to get guys healthy, even if we have to rest Anthony Davis and Brian later in the season, like how the – how not the Warriors, the, the Nuggets were doing, like resting a couple of their guys. So if we could do that, just be healthy, have a solid role pieces around us, we have a chance, bro. Like I don't think we need to make this huge move. We just need to retool a little bit, get some different role players in there, bring back the ones that we know played well. And we're good. Yeah. Listen, man, I suit up. Hey, they need me. I suit up, bro. I will spot up. I give you a couple of three. I ain't gonna give you no defense, like none <laughs> at all, bro. I'd be way worse than D'Lo. But I give you a couple of threes. You know, man, I might dime out a little bit. I'll assist. I give dime you, out. I, I'll dime out a little bit. I'll use six of my fouls. I'll foul out. I'll use all of them. You know what I'm saying? So. Average of 5.7 fouls per game. <laughs> Pretty, bro, listen, I'm going to contribute, though. They're going to be hard fouls. Like, matter of fact, I'm going to get Jokic ejected. Like, I'll take the whiplash that, my, that the Morris twin did. I'll take that, <laughs> get bro ejected, and we win. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, man. How Give many points? Up, man. You got You got 20 minutes in an NBA game. <clears throat> What's your stat line? All right. Answering this seriously, 20 minutes in an NBA game. Who am and I you, playing? You have, the green, you have the green light. You are playing the Utah <laughs> Jazz. Lori Markin is hurt. Con Sexton is hurt. <laughs> Kessler is hurt. Like the best possible opportunity. But it's still NBA players. You got 20 but it's minutes. still NBA players. I got, I got 20 minutes and I got the All green right. light. Darvaham turned to you and said, damn, get in the game. Hey, it's your, it's your time, bro. It's me. It's me right now. I right, bet. Say no more. I'm Check into the game, boom. I'm locked in already. All right, cool. This is my game plan already. I'm not driving to the basket. They way too tall. I'm not doing that. So I'm shooting like at least like 23s within 20. I'm shooting a three a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shooting a three every minute. Now I could shoot. Like I could I'm not an NBA shooter, obviously, but I could shoot. I think if I shoot 23s, I could probably make about five. If I shoot 20, you know what I mean? I'm just, I'm, that's not bad. And 25%. I'm checking. I'm chucking, so I'm gonna get I'm gonna get 15 points, just off the fact that I, of value, not even the fact that like oh I'm cooking nobody, just off pure volume alone, volume alone. AD come set this screen, come off they in drop coverage, boom, I'm knocking it down. Simple. I give you 15 points. Okay. Straight okay. like that. Terrible probably... efficiency. I'm giving up like 30. Whoever I'm guarding is killing me. Like I'm giving up like 30. If I give you 15. See, I I probably give you about six, and I'm cherry picking, not playing no <laughs> defense. Like, bro, this shot go up, I'm, I'm out. Right, I'm right. Out. It's definitely a four on five though, one hundred percent. Like yeah. y'all gotta have to play a two two zone because I'm I'm not guarding nobody. I'm doing my best Kyle Lowry impression. I'm I'm running, and I'm I'm trying to take all the charges. That's all I got. For y'all. <laughs> I don't have no type of defense. I can't move my feet like that. 
my knee going to buckle. I don't, <laughs> I don't have anything for that. Um, last couple of rumors here. Bleacher Report is, is reporting that um, teams have been calling the, the Blazers for the number three pick. So they've heard from various teams, different trade packages. So that is apparently still on the table. But they are also reporting that the Blazers still – plan to build around Dame. So, look, we don't got to go too far into it, but like we said, bro, yeah, they got to just pick a direction. If this is the direction, I can I can still say I think it's the wrong one, but if you're going to do it, bro, trade some of this young talent, trade the pick, at least get a competitive, competent roster around him and let him compete at this point in his career. I think – Listen, I'm fully on the side of trade Damian Lillard at this point. I just think that who are you going to get back? Like, who are you going to get back at this point? That is That can make you a contender. Like, I've seen the, excuse me, the Jalen Brown trade, like, or potential, like, oh, send Jalen Brown to Portland. You get the third overall pick, Anthony Simons. It's like, one, I don't think Boston's going to do that because I, I think they're in a win-now mode. So if you're trading with Boston, they're going to want Damian Lillard back, I feel like. Right. But even if you make that trade, Damian Lillard and Jalen Brown, you're not winning a championship with that. Like, they saw, what is so, the, there's a lot of question marks on that roster. Exactly. So. There's, an, I don't think there's a trade out there. With the, if you had the number one overall pick, one, I would think you'd be dumb for trading anyway. But if you are dumb enough that you want to build around Dame, and you, that it'd be a little bit different because you have the number one overall pick. Like, there's going to be a crazy package for Wimby, but. The number three overall pick, I don't think you're going to get enough back to make your team a contender with Damian Lillard. So I feel like, honestly, you should just be looking to trade Dame, rebuild. Like, I've seen the the, the reports now about um how the Hornets are possibly going to take Brandon Miller mm-hmm. over Scoot Henderson. So if you can get Scoot at three. Get Dame out like, of there. I, yeah, I think you should just trade Dame, bro, and just go into a full rebuild at this point. Because mm-hmm. this is – I feel like this is – the most you could, at this point, this is the most you can possibly get for Dame with his age, the way he played this season. He had a great season. I feel like this is like his peak value right now. Mm-hmm. Just trade Dame a little bit, in my opinion. Yep. Yeah, I think you're 100 percent right because he's only getting older. He's had a couple of injuries these last couple of years. The biggest one being that the ab injury that he he had coming out of the Olympics. Um, so coming off of this year, you have the number three pick. Like, just you, you got to hit the reset button. It's been a great, yeah, however, what, 12 years, 13 years, however long it's been, been great. It's time. <laughs> the, <laughs> it's time. The, the window, I think, has passed. And yeah. uh, there is a, there's a timeline out there where they got to number one pick and definitely traded it for some crazy package <laughs> to, to build around Dame. Um, but even, but I'm glad they... that ain't this timeline because that, that would have been crazy. Getting the number one pick, I'd rather you just draft Wimby and keep Dame and just go like that than you trading either that. one of those guys at that point. All right. Um, another another story that came out right before I think game one tipped off. Um, Adam Silver came out and said that the NBA has uncovered a fair amount of new info surrounding the second John Morant incident, and they're not going to announce any of their disciplinary decisions until after the finals ends, which to me is not a good sign at all. Um, He's out of there. (laughs) This season will be without John Morant (laughs) because he's out of there, bro. I'm sorry. What could they possibly have found? Because I also saw, and I think this is crazy, Stephen A. Smith said that he said, in some NBA inner circles that he's in, he has his ears too. Somebody was speculating that John Morant wasn't going to be alive in five years. I was like, bro. Alive? Yes. Like, I don't know what is what going is type, on. What, what is he in? Saying. What has bro got himself into? I don't know. But look, whatever it is, if – this is what Adam Silver is coming out and saying. The only comparable situation, the one that always is going to come up, right, is Gilbert Arenas, who had the, what was it, a 50-game suspension, right? Let me, let me mm. make sure I double-check that. Um, he had the, the suspension after bringing the gun 
to the uh, to the practice facility, right? Um, this does not seem to be on the same level, not even close to mm-hmm. that. So, what whatever it is, the deep dive of investigation we already talked about, you know, some of the other episodes that we've done. We know the NBA is the feds. They move. Facts. They move federal. So you can't <laughs> hide anything. So whatever, Facts. whatever deep dive they've done on Ja, um, it does not sound good. So he's probably ruining his career, bro. This is sad, man. Like this yeah. is he's getting. He's getting. I think he might get a year suspension, bro. That would be crazy. I genuinely think he might, because just the way they've been talking, the way they've been saying, like, it, at worst, he's going to be going for at least half the year. Like, he's not going to be playing before the All-Star break. Like, I don't think there's no chance he's playing before the All-Star break. So, but at that point, it's like, bro, with his, like, with his history, the fact that he's done it before, you already had this coaching, this counseling, this all, oh, he went to rehab for three days in Florida. Like, that didn't do nothing. He had a talk mm-hmm. with Adam Silver. That didn't do nothing, bro. Like, he don't really care. You had that. And he's going to come back. He did it again. He might be gone, bro. Like, he might be out of there for this year. Yeah, I... I just can't, like... I just... Whatever it is, the fact that he doesn't want to come out and say it during the finals... That that's in and crazy. of itself is telling that, like, bro, this is about to be a bombshell that's gonna get dropped. Um, because that that makes it feel like he thinks it's like gonna impact the league, it's gonna impact viewership or ratings or something like that. He yeah. doesn't want to mess with any of that. And so Sheesh. oh my god. Yeah, so look, whatever it is, I am. I, we said it many times, like, look, I'm always going to wish Ja the best. I hope that he can get everything sorted out. But it does not seem like stuff is trending in a good direction for him. And it seemed like Adam Silver and them, the, the federal investigators over at the NBA League office have got, got something on him. So They don't, they don't play, bro. They do not they do play. Not play. Bro. They know more about you than you know about yourself. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> Uh, I saw somebody make a joke too that said that uh, is this is something only Adam Silver would have done. They said if it was David Stern, David Stern would have came out at halftime of a, a game, one of the finals, like a WWE <laughs> promo, and, and announced John Morant season long suspension. He would have made, made it like a spectacle. That is facts. Um, David Stern, he didn't play, bro. Adam Silver, bro, a lot of these players, lucky Adam Silver is the, is the, the players can miss that he is, bro. David Stern. <laughs> he was, he David was Stern about was good. business. He was bro. not playing around with the money, bro. David Stern did not play, bro. He didn't care about your feelings. He didn't care about none of that, bro. Oh, my God. But, yeah, it, it's, man, it's sad, bro. It really is sad because it's like, I, was just, I, I forgot what I was listening to. They were talking about John Moran. It's like, he could have. I mean, I don't know. It depends on how the suspension goes. But, like, John Moran had a path to be, like, almost the face of the NBA. Even if he's not the best player in the NBA. Just the way – just from the perspective of, like – think about it this way. Ca- uh, the casual NBA fan, what right. are they, like, seeing? Threes or dunks? John Morant's high-flying, mm-hmm. like, super super athletic, super electric. It's, like, a lot of these uh, – a lot of these, like, foreign players, like Jokic, Giannis, they, they're better, obviously. But they don't really market themselves as the way – in the way of like, I want to be the face of the NBA. They don't. Giannis, really Giannis does. Jokic definitely does it, but Giannis Jokic doesn't care. Giannis, Giannis is being I like. A lot of I think Giannis. <laughs> yeah, I think Giannis is funny. I like Giannis. I think yeah. Giannis is funny. But as far as the way the game is played, his game, as far as John Moran's game, is just more attractive to the casual viewer. Mm-hmm. So I feel like in that aspect, it's like any like he looks like a lot of like a lot of us. Like you know what I'm saying? He got dreads. He got the tats. Like you know what I'm saying? He seems like a cool guy. Besides all this like gun stuff. But he he had a, a path to be like known as like the face of the NBA once like the Stephs and LeBrons retire. So to see this, it, it's it's kind of sad to see honestly. Yeah, I hope for the best. I hope this is like a. I still thought like it was gonna be like a half season suspension, whatever. And like, look, he comes back. All of this is behind him. He gets everything back on track. So look, I'm still hopeful that that's the case. 
Um, but this whole ominous, we're not going to say anything until after the finals, does not give me a lot of faith there. So, uh, what if, what if Abdul was just like, you know, we had to wait till after the finals, we had to do this 15 game suspension? <laughs> I, I kind of feel like that could be out too. And look, I hope because. I don't want him to be in no more trouble because, like you said, he has is on the path to could have potentially been the face, if not one of the faces of the league. And I never want to wish nobody no, no bad karma, right. bad circumstances. So mm-hmm. I hope he figures it out. Man. I hope he figures it out. Um. Also wanted to to get your thoughts on a, a viral tweet that's kind of made its rounds on NBA Twitter. Um, five players from the 2016 draft that were they just put them all you know in a in a graphic and asked people to to rank them or draft them um so five players are Jalen Brown Jamal Murray Damata Sabonis Pascal Siakam and Brandon Ingram and I've seen probably every combination of players and it couldn't have come at a crazier time coming off of Jamal Murray being Crazy playoff riser, Jalen exactly. Brown having a disappointing playoff, especially in the Eastern Conference Finals. So mm-hmm. um, I'm interested to see your thoughts because I've seen, like I said, I've seen, I've seen Siakam first, I've seen Siakam last, I've seen <laughs> Sabonis first, I've seen Sabonis last. So I don't think there's any wrong answer, but I'm interested to see your opinion on, on this. You know what, what people are saying here. So teams don't matter. This is just ranking, like. How which would I rather have basically? Right, yeah. Uh see this one, this is hard. I'm gonna tell you right now. I think that Sabonis is last for me. Really? I think that he's last just off the fact that we've seen in this playoffs. I don't think his play style necessarily translates to the playoffs in a great way. And we mm-hmm. kind of seen it like a, the big that is a post-up big, but that doesn't really shoot, but it's also not, like, a great rim protector. Like, I don't think that really trans- translate well to the playoffs. Mm-hmm. So, like, he's not a bad player, obviously, but I think I would have Sabonis last. I, I also think this JB recency bias is killing a lot of people. He is not the worst player on this list. He's not. I'm sorry. He's not yeah, the worst no. player on this list. So, I can't have him last. Uh, I'm looking at the players right now. This is tough. Oh, right, so I already got some bonus last. So it's between JB, Murray, Siakam, and BI. I remember before I said I like BI over Siakam, so I at least got to be consistent with that mm-hmm. when we talked about the ringer top 100. Oh, Siakam's nice, though. I think I'll have. Is it, For me, it's JB and Jamal 1 and 2. I'm just trying to figure out which one I'd rather have first. I think I'll lean. So I'll lean Jamal. I think I'll lean Jamal first. Just because this and this is not like the, the recency bias with him is a little bit different. I feel like because this this isn't his first postseason like playing well. He's done right. this in the bubble. Right. If he never got hurt, who knows where he'd be at right he now? He probably right. has multiple all star selections. He might have an all NBA selection. That's what I'm saying. You don't know where he'd be at right now. This right. is not this is not like a new occurrence for him. So I mm-hmm. think I'll have Jamal first. I'll still have JB second, even though he has no left hand. But like he can work on that. <laughs> He's young. He can work on that. So I'll go Jamal, JB. I'll go BIC Alcum Sabonis. Okay. Okay. I have a little bit of a different list. And I, like you, am a, a little bit biased. BI is one of my favorite players to watch. I actually think. It's hard to put the bias aside here. I might take B.I. <laughs> first. Ooh. Okay. So I might go B.I. first. And then it's tight between Siakam and Jamal for that two spot. Mm-hmm. But I think I might go. Ah, uh, I feel like Siakam has kind of become underrated a little bit because yeah, he's to continue to have good years in Toronto's post. He made a long day, like two years ago, right? Yeah. Um, and so even with them kind of having a disappointing year this year, he played very well in Toronto. Still, is one of the most versatile, you know, fours in the league. 
um, in terms of what he can provide on the offensive side of the ball and on the defensive side of the ball. So for me, I think I'm going to have to actually go B.I., Siakam, Jamal, Jalen Brown, and then Sabonis last. Ooh, that's tough. That's tough. It's not, definitely not a bad list. Definitely yeah. not a bad list. Like you said, I don't think there's no wrong answers. But these, it's just interesting to see these. These players are so close and like they're right. They're they're all they're like, kind of within that same tier of players. Exactly. They the bro. They can all like I can see why the list can go from so many different places. So I definitely understand it. Mm-hmm. You all. You also have Sabonis last. Is it for the same reasons that I said, or just similarly? Kind of, just yeah. like when I I look at it right, like bi to me especially this past season, like we already know what he's been able to do as a scorer. What's really impressed me with him is I think a lot of this has to do with they don't really have a point guard there. Like they've been putting CJ at the one, and then obviously they want, they want to do the point forward stuff for Zion. But when he's hurt, that role kind of gets deflected onto Brandon Ingram. And mm-hmm. this year he took a massive leap in his playmaking ability. 100%. So I think his offensive game all around is just – it is on a very elite level. He Obviously, like – his ability to score, he's one of those players that feels like he gets into that mode where it's like you can't stop him. Like you just hope to make it uncomfortable, but like you kind of just have to pray he's going to miss sometimes, right? Like when he gets into mm-hmm. that that type of mode. So it's that. With Sabonis, it's crazy because now I'm thinking about it. I have uh, Jalen Brown and Sabonis at four and five, and they're the only two people on this list that made all NBA this year. That guy is kind of crazy when you really think about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, it just is. I think to your point, right? His defense is not. It leaves a lot to be desired, especially from a, a rim protection perspective, which is tough as a center in this league. Um, and I think he definitely has got to be a more willing shooter. Um, that being mm-hmm. as exploitable as it was in the Warrior series was not good. Um, like. That set up the Warriors' defense for success a lot more than it should have. Um, so a, a little bit is factored in by that, but, but some of it is just that's I think Siakam is just more versatile as a scorer on the offensive side of the ball. I think he's a better defender. Um, Jamal Murray, to your point, like if he hadn't gotten hurt, I think he, he would be in these same conversations of having made all NBA teams potentially this year, having made all star teams. Um, so I don't think it's a slight to have him above the guys that already did make all NBA this year, just because he's clearly on that caliber of player um, mm-hmm. definitely benefits from playing with Jokic. But at the end of the day, like their success is a large part of that is due to his play. So um, yeah, it, it definitely interesting that the two all NBA guys are NBA guys are last. Um, <laughs> so my list is Brandon Ingram, Siakam, Jamal Murray, Jalen Brown, and then Sabonis. And what's your list? And my list is Jamal Murray, Jalen Brown, B.I., Siakam, Sabonis. Okay. So had to, make sh- had to make sure we repeat that for the, the TikToks. So we could get the yeah. nice little edit in there. <laughs> oh, my God. These guys don't know what they're talking about. He has this guy over. Like, bro, oh, I can see it now. Yeah. Bro, it's, bro, it's, it's always going to be opinionated. And like I said, I don't think you could put them in any order. I'm not going to think it's wrong like they're Mm -hmm. all very close and i think getting into these debates about how do you have this guy ahead of this guy it's like bro it's one spot you know like if you put somebody in a tier they're not supposed to be in then okay but like splitting hairs about who's the 12th or the 13th best player in the nba is like what are we doing here what are we doing here like who really cares? But I remember I seen the TikTok. <laughs> I did like it was a football TikTok, and it was compared. I forgot the tight ends, bro. But it was like the comparison was like Moali Cox and like, bro, I don't even know. It was some like Austin Hooper or something like that. And and the comments was like, bro, are y'all really comparing Moali Cox and Austin Hooper? Right? Like, why are we? <laughs> what even, are we like, doing? What are like, we like? Certain people don't need to be compared, bro. Like that's that kills me, bro. That really kills me. Yeah. Uh, last thing I want to want to do on today's pod, as we're getting into the off season, I'm excited because we can get we can go go through um, some more things like this. I want to do a draft of the best players to go straight to the NBA out of high school. 
And so I want to do it with starting five and then a six man. Okay. So six players each. Um, I have a, the full list here. There's been 41 players to go straight from high school to the NBA. So definitely a lot of people to pick from. Um, I'm going to give you the first pick. I think it doesn't really matter. The first two picks are probably going to be the same in all these drafts. But I'm going to give you the first pick. So this is the straight out of high school to the NBA draft. You are on the clock. First pick is yours. LeBron. <laughs> right. <laughs> that, was, that was mad easy. Right. Tossing it back to me, and I'm taking Kobe. <laughs> All right, bet. Let me Knock the obvious to pull up two out the way. Play. Um, all right, all right, all right. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Let me just pull up. Let me just pull up the list real quick. Mm-hmm. Oh, they got some. There's some names up here. It's there some, are some heavy hitters, bro. It's some names up here. But why isn't? It, am I bugging or did Tim Duncan come straight out of high school? Tim Duncan went to Wake Forest. He did go Wake Forest. You're right. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're going by position. So I got LeBron as my three. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, for my next pick, I'm going to go – Oh, I'm going to go Kevin Garnett. Oh, my gosh. I was hoping he would fall. I'm okay. going to go KG. Okay. <clears throat> um, I got a couple of options here, a couple of good names still. I can't give you this guy because it would be too crazy. So, with my second pick, I got to take Dwight at the five. Okay. If KG okay, and Dwight would be. Who's, nobody who, no one's scoring. <laughs> no way. Braun on the wing, nobody's scoring. Yeah, okay. okay. All right. I'm going to show some love to my old heads. We're going to go Moses Malone. Moses Malone. Did Moses Malone, didn't he go to college? That's what it says right here well, on my list. I'm a, Unless the list is wrong. Let me watch play Yeah, bro, play that Maryland. Why you trying to cheat? Well, my bad, bro. What? All right, send me the list you got, there, because my list is just bad. I need the list you got. <laughs> uh, what do you want? What do you want for your list? What are you looking at? Oh no, wait. I do see that he went to high school to the pros. So what? Oh, oh yeah. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Oh yeah. Oh, he signed a letter of intent to play for Maryland, and I think just went out of high school. Okay. All right. So you can keep Moses Malone. All right. All oh right, yeah, right. we up. All right, bet, bet, bet. Dang. So what is my list looking at? Why Moses Malone not on my <laughs> list? I gotta go get a different list. Hold on. Um, I know who I know who your next pick is gonna be easily. I know. I think I, I do definitely too. Definitely know who your next pick is gonna be. <laughs> if it's not, I'm putting them at the two, and I'm new, and I'm picking up. Um. So I got. I got Kobe at the two. I got Dwight at the five. Hmm. Yeah, I can't pass on T Mac at the three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh How my gosh, it? the wings, wing scores are crazy right now. Okay. Kobe and T Mac, that's tough. That's tough. Yeah. Right, so I got I got Braun. I got Moses. I got KG. Ooh, I need some guards. I'm thinking it's between – this is tough. This is tough. This is tough. No, I'm going to go – I'm going to go Monte Ellis. Monte Ellis. Mon- Monte Ellis was ni- – Monte Ellis was nice. Like, he, was he, was, he was a bucket. I used to give people the business with Monte Ellis on 2K11. <laughs> 2K? Bro, he was nice in 2K. Jump shot was crisp and everything. Yeah. But I'm glad this guy slid to me. With my fourth pick at the four, I'm gonna take Amari Stoudemire. Mm-hmm. I seen it. That's a good pick. That's definitely a good right. pick. I just had no bigs. Like it was tough. That was a good yeah. pick though. And with this, my last pick, it's between two guys for me. But I'm gonna go Stephen Jackson. Okay, Stack Jack. Okay, yeah, he he was a he was a solid player, but he was solid. I need a point guard. <laughs> bro, it's no it's bro, it's no point guards in this. Like Monte gonna play my one. It's like no point guards in this list. At least like great mm. point guards. There is some, there's somebody on this list who before injury 
I, look, that's ex- I, I'm literally covering him right now. So my fifth pick at the one, Sean Livingston. Where well, we are a big team. Yo, wait, yo, you got Sean. You got Sean listening to Kobe, T Mac, Stunner, yeah. and Dwight. Yo, the oh, length yeah. on the team is crazy. Okay, okay, that's crazy. All right, that was my. That was the last picture, right? Uh, okay. yes, yeah, so you got the six man now, right? Oh, the six. Okay, bet, bet, bet. Oh, say no more. I bet for my six man. Uh, I can't leave this guy off the list, man. I can't. Yeah, I can't. I can't leave this guy off the list. Six man. I don't know how he ain't go first overall pick. I'm a, where's he at? Hold on. Yeah, I don't know how he ain't go first overall pick. Kwame Brown. Oh my God. You're nah, I'm playing, crazy. I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing. I'm, playing, I'm, playing. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Absolutely <laughs> not. My six, my six man is going to be Sean Kemp. Sean Kemp. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hmm. So then. That's not what I thought you were gonna pick. I, now I gotta pick between two guys. Okay. It was between it was between him and somebody else, but I, I'll, I'll go Sean Kemp. Oh, actually, it's between three people. Now that I look at it again. Yeah, it's it's definitely some it's definitely some good ones up here for sure. So I got one of the best six man ever. Lou Will still on the board. Mm-hmm. JR still on the board. That was who I was thinking you about. You know who Jay Smooth still on the board. Josh That's Smith. another one. It, I mean, listen, those are all great picks. I ain't even gonna be mad at those are some great picks. Um, what does my team need? Like, what would they really need? Like and hey, my team, my team defense is on L's though. We clamping everything. Yeah. Yeah. My team defense is locked. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna be a little biased because another player I used to go too crazy with on 2K. Give me Josh Smith. Give me Josh Smith. That little stretch of run he had in Atlanta. And he, he was like that. He was like that. So he was definitely nice. He was definitely nice. So what's your full team? My full team at the one I have Sean Livingston, Kobe at the two, T Mac at the three, Amari Stoudemire at the four. Dwight Howard at the five, and then Josh Smith is my sixth man off the bench. I like that team a lot. So my team is at the one, I got Monte Ellis. At the two, I got Steven Jackson. At the three, I got Bron Bron. At the four, I got KG. At the five, I got Moses Malone. And my sixth man is Sean Kemp. Yeah, the uh, defense is crazy. Defense L's. Is crazy. Oh, yeah. L's. We locking everything up. <laughs> Nobody's yeah. scoring. Y'all go ahead and drop a comment and let us know which team you thought thought was better team you thought would win in a seven game series. <laughs> You're not lo- my team not losing. I like it. I like how your team got like no short players though. Zero. Team- <laughs> Sean Livingston. We switching. Like pre- we switching everything. <laughs> not facts. Is it is this pre injury Sean Livingston? It might, it might be in some trouble. It could bro. Ooh. It could be post injury Sean. Livingston. Give me give me Warrior Sean Livingston. That little that midi. Right. Never seen him miss a, cont- a contested mini in my life. <laughs> that shot was unstoppable. Unstoppable. But yeah, I'm excited to do more of these in the offseason because it's so it's mm-hmm. like it's so much. You gotta bring the content in the offseason. We get to, that's the perfect time to just let the nostalgia take over. Let's Facts. These the like stuff like this is gonna be mad fun to do. Yeah, for sure. Um yeah, no, no basketball on tonight, sadly. They don't play until tomorrow. Yeah. You got two days off between every single game. That changes my whole plan. I was supposed to go to the movies tomorrow. I was supposed to. Man, that changes my whole plans. Yeah, so right, I'm, I'm doing all the little errands chores today. Cause look, seven thirty hit tomorrow. I'm in front of the big screen. <laughs> Locked. Can can't miss that. See, that's yeah. That changes everything. But I'm excited though. I feel like. I kind of want the Heat to steal one. I do too. I still I want this series to be competitive. Like as much as I think the uh, the um, Nuggets are the better team and going to win this series. Like even if they like even if it was a sweep, I want it to be like a sweep against the Lakers. Like I want it to right be close. close every single game. Yeah. All right. I saw actually now that you brought that up. Let me pull this up. 
Um, the point differential between the Nuggets and the Lakers um, in their series was like the fourth or fifth lowest point differentials in any playoff series this postseason. Bro, and it was a sweet. Bro, that did not feel like a sweep. I don't, I don't know if there's a thing as a competitive sweep or like a close okay. sweep, bro. But if, if there, there is, is, that's, that's it. it. Like, I'm telling you, we were in every single game, bro. We're down 0-3. I'm thinking like, bro, we just made, we get a few more bounces. Like, we're good. Like, bro, that, that series was close, bro. I don't care what nobody said. Anybody who watched it, that series was mad close, bro. Yeah, I literally don't think you could have had a closer. I don't know if we'll ever see a, a sweep that close. I can't yeah. think of one any closer than that in at least recent history. Like the the closest one I could think of was the Brooklyn Boston one because like they won their games. That's true. They, they won their games somewhat close, but that it that one. I mean, I guess you. I was about to say I get like that one. Boston felt like the better team still, like easily. But I mean, the Nuggets also felt like the better team. Yeah. So. Yeah, those are the only two close sweeps that I really remember. But this one, more so than that one, I really felt like we were in every single game. Like, we could have won all of those games, bro. Now, that's a good comparison because they both of those series had one game that came down to the last shot. Obviously, they had mm -hmm. the, the Jason Tatum buzzer beater in that one. And in this one, you got LeBron with the ball in his hands. Just yeah, couldn't bro. get a shot off. <laughs> it's tough, man. It yeah. is tough. Damn. Definitely. Uh, still hurts, man. It still hurts. Quick pivot to the gridiron. Where do you think D Hop going? Bills. Bills? Mm. That would be so disgusting. To if he I wants to win the championship, what well, like he said he wants to, or win the Super Bowl, he needs to go. He has to go to the Bills. I think, well, not has to. He can go to the Bills or the Chiefs, but I just think, I think the Chiefs don't need him. They just want a Super Bowl with no receivers, basically. Like, Pat Mahomes, Andy Reid is too good. Like, <laughs> Chico. It's just too good. Yeah, yeah, they're too good, bro. But I think the Bills, they need a number two receiver, bro. Postseason, it's like the last three postseasons, Diggs has, Diggs has been on lock, bro. Like, he's had like 20 yards in each of those three last postseasons, bro. It's they put bad. that bracket coverage on him. Yeah, he's just in a Where box. did Gabe Davis go? Yeah, he, had, he had four of them. He had four of them teddies, one, one of them postseasons, one of those games against the Chiefs. But yeah. other than that, he's been – he's not a number two, like. So I think he's going. I think he's going to the Bills. But I seen reports that he might go back to the Texans. He said he wasn't opposed to that. I did see that. They said that he liked C.J. Stroud a lot. So I don't I know. Mean, I feel like that doesn't check off the boxes for trying to win. None at the all. Team is not there yet. It's either you go for the I'm trying to win a ring route or the I'm at the end of my career. Like let me just pack it in for the rest of the for my next couple of years. So I think it'd be great for C.J. Stroud though. Like for his development, oh, for like, sure, yeah. Cause I seen something that was like, bro, he's about to go from like JSN, Marvin Harrison Jr., Alave, Gary Wilson to John Mechie and uh, Nico Collins. Like that's a big <laughs> that is drop off. Crazy. Look, that's, find out if he's a really good QB or not. That's true, but it's like that's a wake up call, bro. Like, yeah, that is as wild. A, as a former QB myself. Listen, throwing to your number one and throwing to somebody that's nowhere on his level is a completely different. Like, listen, it's a it's a shock, bro. Trust me, I'm already knowing. Um, another guy who we don't know where he's gonna play next year. Where do you think Dalvin Cook is going? I think that's your that's your former him. fantasy RB. I don't even want to hear that, bro. I'm good on him, bro. He pissed me <laughs> off all year, bro. So inconsistent. Then as soon as I trade him away, he starts playing well. Like, get, bro. I. I Dalvin Cook, I don't even want to see your face no more, bro. But I think he's going to the Dolphins. <laughs> the Dolphins. Which, they don't even be. need more running backs, though. Don't they? Are they good? They don't. They running backs are solid. Dalvin, Dalvin is better than both of them, though. But That's true. I think the thing is, most is always hurt. Jeff Wilson is also always hurt. Like, But they both nice, though. Like, mm -hmm. They both good. But Dalvin is just – Dalvin in that offense, though, would be crazy. Like, don't they have Chase Edmonds, too? No, nah, I think they cut him now. He was, bro, he was supposed to be the guy over there, and then he just sucked. Like, he, I don't know, he just stunk. But they cut him, and he's on – oh, I forgot. He's somewhere now, but, like, he's just – he's washed, bro. He's done, Dang. which is crazy because he was kind of nice in Arizona. He was. He was looking like he was going to be the fantasy steal. That's Great value the, McCaffrey. 
that's why I thought, bro, I drafted him. Like, yo, he's going to be the one at the Dolphins. His high power offense is going to be nice. Bro, had one good game and stunk. Yeah. Which was I think I, I picked him up off waivers. I was like, man, let's get it. Somebody dropped him after bro. the good game. Somebody dropped him. And I was like, and I was pissed because you picked him up. I was like, bro, no way somebody just gave this dude to Billy. And this dude just stunk, bro. Yeah. Oh um, my god, he's my RB two. He's like, I'm an RB two in my other league. Crazy. I'm. I see a report here that says that uh, Alexander Madison might be the starting back in Minnesota. Bro, yeah, bro. They say he's the three. Like if Dalvin leaves, he's the three down back, bro. That's what they said. Fantasy wise, yeah, I need that. Look, <laughs> I I'm, need that. I'm keeping my eye on that one. <laughs> might be a late round, late round scoop because bro, that's needed. If he gets all the carries there. He gonna be he gonna be like Dalvin. We need to get this draft situated. We need to get this need to get this rolling on the dynasty league. You know, I'm a I'm a matter of fact. I'll try to do that today, bro. I need to talk to. I need to see if we can get the people because we got I think eight. We try to do twelve. No, we can do ten. Okay. It don't need to be twelve, bro. Let's get thirty two. Hell no. <laughs> Hell no. I'm not doing that. Thirty two people in an auction draft would be crazy. I'm literally just gonna spend. All of my two hundred dollars on Justin Jefferson, and I don't care who else is on the team, bro. Like, <laughs> like, bro, it, I don't care at that point. I'm gonna have a bunch of third string tight ends, bro. I'll be straight. <laughs> Dude's going with, with J. Jeff putting up thirty five. Rest his team combining for twelve. Exactly, and I'll be perfectly <laughs> fine, bro. I'll be good. Uh, I'm going back to back to back though, so ain't nothing, ain't nothing to worry about. We're good. I'm not letting it, bro. I'm not letting it happen. I promise you, I'm not letting it happen, bro. I'm not letting it slide. Yeah, I heard it here first on the Off the Glass podcast. I'm going back to back to back. Three Pete, Kobe and Shaq, like Michael Jordan, Billy. Bro. <laughs> Those are the names you got to talk about. We talk Mark about my words, bro. Back. I'm not letting that happen, bro. I promise you, I'm not letting it slide like that, bro. You went, bro, you went three straight times. Everybody said, that's what everybody said last year. We put went, money on the line. Did not matter. Listen, if you win three straight times, bro, I'm kicking you out of the league because clearly you're just better than us. So I'm just going to kick you out the league. We win three straight times, bro. I'm getting a belt, and I'm putting it right <laughs> up there on the top of the, that bookcase. I respect it. Man, oh, nah, man. I got to win. I got to win. I'm winning this one. I might not win the Dynasty. I really don't care about this this year, though. Like, for Dynasty, like, I want my team to be set, like, a couple years from now. You know yeah. what I'm saying? When we 30-something, I'm going to have my, I'm gonna have a stacked roster. You know, oh, man, it, bro, I'm right going now. straight. I'm getting Jalen Hurts. I don't care what I will overpay. I'm getting Jalen Hurts. <laughs> I'm gonna get me Bijan or Drake London, some young skill player, mm. straight rookies. That's I, it. I respect it, bro. That's the way to move, bro. Because they're gonna they're gonna be those people that pay up for like Devontae Adams, even though he's like 29. And like two years, bro, their team is gonna be garbage. Like they might win a chip. If you go all now, you might get the chip. But in a couple years, your team gonna be trash, bro. Yeah. You gonna be in a, you gonna be in the process. Yeah. You gonna have, you gonna have to start tanking. Uh, never gonna make the the conference finals. Damn, that's tough. Yeah, gonna demand out. Might have to demand out, bro. Might have to when demand you, out. When your manager get fired because he's the scapegoat. Right. <laughs> now you gotta trade away your star players. Facts, bro. Crazy. Honestly, it's pretty terrible, here, bro, because your star player might forget how to play football like Ben. <laughs> <laughs> man, that's tough. I hate to be a Sixers fan, bro. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's a – that's tough. It's really been – bro, we are going on, like, what, eight, nine years since the whole process stuff started, and they genuinely have nothing, a single – accomplishment as a team to show for it. They don't even have an Eastern Conference championship. Like they don't have an appearance. That's... An appearance. You they could make the that. Eastern Conference Finals the next what four years and still will have less Eastern Conference Finals than Jason Tatum and Jalen <laughs> Man, that's bad, bro. That's bad. That's what they they don't deserve it though. I feel like they don't deserve it. Like you purposely lose for that long, you shouldn't get rewarded with like a dynasty. Like you shouldn't get rewarded for that. Like, nah, bro. I'm straight, bro. The basketball gods not letting that fly, yeah. bro. They not, bro. I'm sorry. Like the basketball gods not letting that fly. 
You tanking purposely for eight years. You're gonna be trash on purpose. Have your fans. I wish the Lakers would tell me, bro, we're gonna suck for the next like eight years of your life, bro. But trust me, it's gonna be worth it. No, bro, I'm not doing that. Like, try to win right. every single year, but I'm not doing that. What's and then get to you? the end of those eight years and have nothing to show for it. You just put me through hell for no reason whatsoever, bro. No, I'm not doing that, bro. I feel like if you're a Sixers fan, if your team tells you, bro, we are tanking, you are actively allowed to root for a new team, though. I'm sorry, bro. If, <laughs> you, if you, can, you can request a trade. <laughs> <laughs> Facts. You can request a trade to be a fan of another team, bro, because there's no way you're telling me you're going to lose. I'm not hearing that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Tankin is a – I think between what they did with the draft odds to flatten it out and this year having two of the four teams in the conference finals being playing teams, all of that combined, I think we're going to finally start to see less, at least, like, egregious tanking because, like, like we said with the Sixers, right, like, they're putting out crazy rosters. Even the Thunder – Bro, they was shutting Shay down like right after yeah. the All Star break. All yeah. of a sudden, he got a sore ankle. Never comes back. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> right. Like, like, <laughs> like you know, like now at least must I think be a team, good life though. Like as a like think as a star player, they're like, we're we gonna clear. pay you. I'm about to say we're gonna pay you. You don't even gotta show up to work, bro. You right. ain't gotta show up to work, bro. You good? That must be a good life. Yeah. You chill, um, and you not actually hurt. You not rehabbing. Like you just. You chilling, right? You just come, be fitted, core size seats, right? Like you good, my, you good. My job need to tank and put me on ice, bro. That's what they need to do. <laughs> we about to go on IR. Yeah, <laughs> we good, bro. Oh um, man, well that's gonna do it for another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. Um, if you made it this far in the episode, as always, we appreciate you. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe to the channel if you're on YouTube. If you're on any of the audio platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, be sure to go ahead and drop five stars on the podcast. We appreciate it. Uh, and as always, I'm Billy. That's Dame, and we out. Yes, sir.